45 years ago, an Apollo rocket launched here at the Kennedy Space Center, completed its moonshot, and won the space race for America. It was a $25 billion investment by the U.S. government. That's $165 billion in today's money. But just three years and six lunar landings later, we lost interest. It wasn't until 2013 when China landed the Chang'e 3 rover on the moon that humanity returned to the lunar surface. But that was a state-funded project that cost hundreds of millions of dollars and was ultimately unsuccessful. With no competition to spur us on, humanity's interest in the moon cooled. But things are starting to heat up. There's a new competition, a new space race, a $30 million Google Lunar X Prize. Independent teams are racing to collect it. The winner of the Google Lunar X Prize has to complete three criteria. First and most important being actually landing on the moon. Once there, it needs to cover 500 meters, either on, above, or even below the lunar surface. And all the while, it needs to be broadcasting back high-definition video to those of us stuck here on Earth. The first team to do that gets $20 million, a nice chunk of change, but just a fraction of the money they're going to have to spend to get to the moon in the first place. Second place team, if there is one, will get $5 million, while the last $5 million of the $30 million purse is split up into optional challenges, things like surveying historic locations on the moon and covering extra distance. 33 teams were entered into the Google Lunar X Prize, and of those, just five were selected for the so-called milestone prizes. That's $6 million awarded to those teams that can demonstrate that they have the technology and the know-how to land on the moon. This is the story of those five teams. First is Astrobotic, a Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania-based team with strong ties to Carnegie Mellon University. Astrobotic was spun out from Carnegie Mellon in 2007. Uh, we are located in the Strip District in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, uh, about five minutes from Carnegie Mellon. Astrobotic has taken an approach of um, being what I would call a large cargo carrier. They're actually looking to take a number of other teams with them to the lunar surface. They're trying to, to take a large lander that could also be used for future cargo missions. So it's very interesting commercial development which should come out of this. Uh, it's actually far more complicated than just unloading a few rovers. Uh, we hope to uh, release some of these payloads in orbit. Some of them want to land. We're going to release some payloads in translunar, uh, after translunar injection as we fly towards the moon. And then we want to release some of the rovers on the ground. So we have to come up with a model that takes all of that into account, not just the ground race that's going to happen when we drop all the vehicles off. I think Astrobotic is going to do great things. We want to prove that we can land precisely um, and accurately while avoiding all the hazards. So for me personally, I'd really like to see my software be useful for pinpoint landing because that's really exciting. I, I'm the only woman here out of Maston and Astrobotic, so that, that's, that's kind of exciting to inspire women and girls to follow their passions and explore a career in, and contribute to the state of art of space exploration, computer vision. So our goal is to, uh, to cre extend humanity's reach into space, create a sustainable uh, economy and ecosystem that, that can work there. Uh, and as that cost comes down, it gets that much closer. And then we can turn the, the moon into the eighth continent. Team Hakuto is based in Hamamatsu, Japan, and has some very interesting rover designs. <laughs> The technical team is located in Tohoku University, which is a city of Sendai, uh, north of Tokyo. And the business team is mostly located in Tokyo area. XPRIZE gave us a very unique opportunity to bring our rovers and demonstrate the mobility. But uh, our final goal is to contribute to the science. Hakuto's uh, solution to the X Prize requirements is Moonraker, the larger of the two. They have a secondary um, set of objectives that don't have anything to do with X Prize, and that is to look into what are termed lava tubes on the on the moon. There used to be used to be uh, volcanic activities on the surface of the moon. The lava flow uh, built a number of the underground tunnels. 
and uh, some of the tunnels has uh, you know small void or holes, so um, very unique and nice access hole to the underground tunnels. So then first we complete the 500 meter travel and approaching to the edge of the hole. Then as an option, we use this tether system to make an uh, underground um, exploration. Uh, so they're attached by a tether. So out the back of this rover, uh, a tether attaches to the second rover. And it's designed to tow the smaller one. So the second rover has the ability to go down a cliffside and then pull itself back up. And also, there's such an underground structures itself, natural structure, uh, should be useful for the future human habitation. Well, I, I don't know what they're going to find, but it will be really interesting when they do. Whether we win the X Prize or not, we're going to uh, continue to our uh, journey. Team Indus is based in New Delhi, India, and they're sending not one, but two rovers to the moon. <laughs>so for us it's about completing the mission completing the engineering you know qualifying the hardware getting onto a rocket landing on the moon finishing that trek the team was formed by me and a bunch of uh, business associates uh, back in 2010 that's when we found out about google lunar x prize uh, we were looking to work with any other team from india uh, because of restrictions around technology so on and so forth uh, when we found out that there is no team from india we decided to put one up on our own. Our rover is small, so it's, it's four-wheeled. Uh, all four wheels are powered. The front two wheels have steering. It has a collapsible mast. Uh, it is powered using solar panels, relatively small. Overall dimensions would be, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's about, you know, half a meter by half a meter by uh, 40 centimeters. So it's, it's almost a, a, a cube that would fly on top of the lander. And once it is deployed, the mast comes out. Uh, and gives us an antenna height of almost one meter. This is almost 10 years since Ansari X Prize, and, and it's about time. So I think that will be the one big uh, visible, um, you know, uh, uh, step towards uh, consumers getting into space. And that would automatically have a ripple effect and more and more people thinking that there's a lot more that can be done in space, that can be done with space. Moon Express is another American team based in Mountain View, California, and they have some pretty lofty goals for the future of commercial space exploration. So we're here at the Kennedy Space Center where uh, humanity went to the moon. And it's a great honor uh, for us to be not only standing on the shoulders of giants, but working shoulder to shoulder with our NASA colleagues and learning a lot. And there's a new era evolving now. And as behind us, government spaceships reach out to space. Here at the SLF, private spaceships are being built. And uh, our little team of 50 people, um, given the support of NASA and the camaraderie that we're experiencing and the incentive of the moon, um, we're developing and testing our vehicle today. There's one-sixth of Earth gravity on the moon, and that provides a lot of challenges for traction and mobility. And that means that you're mass of your rover should be six times as much to get the same traction. So we thought, well, there's no atmosphere, so there's no aerodynamic forces, there's less gravity, and if we landed once, we should be able to land again. And flying is the best option. And so we're going to hop. Our, our, our mission is going to hop 500 meters, and during that hop, we also have an opportunity to reorient our solar panels to take advantage of wherever the sun might be during that day. Uh, wherever possible, we use consumer technology and upscale it or upgrade it to space qualification. Um, this is a real change from what's usually done traditionally in space where you only fly what you've flown before. Well, there's no opportunity for innovation when you do that. So with imaging, we're going to be using some commercial cameras that we've modified uh, and environmentally tested. And this will be very cool because they are extremely capable and relatively inexpensive and we'll be flying these things for the first time to another world and uh, when we announce uh, what those cameras are I think people will be pretty excited about it. Writing software for an application that's going to go so far away I mean it starts off as a little unreal until you start making more and more progress and realizing like 
oh man, we're gonna have to actually let this thing go at some point. Finally, Team Part-Time Scientist is based in Berlin, Germany, but they have team members located all around the world. The idea for getting started with the part-time scientists came basically when the last announcement for participants was sent out by Google. I think by that time the competition was already running like two years or so. And they were still looking for new teams and they said, okay, if you want to take part in this competition, then you got one more week to apply. And up to this point, I have never heard about the GLXP. So that was uh, really the, what got me interested and I was looking at it and I was really thinking like, why the hell is Google, sorry, can I say this? Yeah. Okay, so I was really thinking like, why the heck is Google giving away 30 million US dollars for something to be sent to the moon? So after talking to other people, I noticed that 30 million is actually not, ev doesn't even cut it for the entire mission cost. And yeah, that's what was fascinated me was to try to get it done in a cheaper way. Because um, when I saw the numbers that usually space missions take place, I really saw that it makes sense to lower the mark. So we're here at the DFKI, and this is a, a German non-profit institute for um, robotics and artificial intelligence research. One of the labs that they have here is this artificial moonscape, which uh, is useful for testing uh, robotic systems, which one day would operate on the moon. This moonscape has a few interesting properties. One of them is that it's optically realistic, so they have the right color and the, the right formation of the surface to give the shadowing effects and the lighting effects that uh, a camera on the moon would actually be looking at. Our goal is actually to conduct at least two more missions in a five to seven year time scale. And the reason for this is because I believe what is important is to build up infrastructure that others can utilize. For example, if we put a, like an LTE base station on the moon, to speak it a little bit simply, and we provide a high gigabit uplink back to Earth via laser link, for example, then other missions, future missions, could use a simple small chip in their components to link into this base station instead of having their own communication solution, which requires a whole lot of power and mass, to dial back to Earth. The reason why I believe this entire Google and XPRIZE and part-time scientists is pretty awesome, at least for me and for most of the people on our team, is that you, you get to learn so much more things that you would have never come in contact with in your normal life. It's the next great space race, and it's happening now. In our next video, we'll show you highlights from those tests as the teams prepare to go on their $20 million moonshot. I'm Tim Stevens from CNET, covering the Google Lunar X Prize.